All right. Thank you all for, for coming to the first colloquial series, fall 2019. I'm uh, uh, Today we're very happy to have Dr. John McKenzie. Uh, Mackenzie Research Performance, Media and Design and teaches at Cornell University. He's the author of Transmedia, Knowledge for Liberal Arts and Community Engagement, a Studio Lab Manifesto from uh, 2019, and a book that the, all the grad students had to read, at least part of it, Perform or Else, From Discipline to Performance from 2001. Mackenzie's work focuses on the nexus of cultural, technological, and organizational performances that shape our contemporary world. He also gives workshops on tactical media and transmedia knowledge for community groups and researchers across the arts and sciences. Working with his collaborator, Aneta Stoinich, uh, as Mackenzie Stoinich, they produce essays, lecture performances, theory, comics, and experimental videos. Today, Mackenzie is going to talk about Civics for a Project, Transmedia Knowledge and Performative Transvaluation in Rural Communities. Um, community, uh, according to McKenzie, community engaged work and performance studies has long focused on the cultural efficacy of theater and other cultural performances, while multivalent uh, performance models remain underutilized. In this talk, McKinsey shows how the Civic Story Project helps to connect campuses and rural communities through strategic storytelling, transmedia knowledge, and critical design to generate civic discourse and action around critical issues. Please join me welcoming Pat John Okay, um, I want to thank Leo for bringing me here and thank the hospitality of the faculty and the graduate students. I loved hearing about your projects. Uh, the music you heard at the very beginning uh, is by a, uh, a fellow uh, uh, named Jordan Bates, and he performs on uh, some of these uh, rap songs under the name Lost Boyevsky, if you're interested in Lost Boyevsky. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be back here at Texas A&M, where I have many old friends and um, I was to telling the faculty when I was at Madison that we really looked at Texas A&M as doing really innovative things here, and so uh, it's a very impressive place. Um, today what I'm going to do is introduce a civic storytelling project that I'm just beginning, and um, I'm going to do so slowly, at first talking about my new book in relationship uh, to the old book, Performer Else. This new book is about a studio lab pedagogy that I have been working on for about 20 years and that I originally invented for performance studies at NYU. The Civic Story Project uh, grows directly out of this book, and indeed some of the rural school teachers uh, that I'm working with are already reading it, so I encourage you to read it too. Um, I've divided my presentation into three parts, theory, design, and activism. So in this first part of my talk, I want to uh, situate the research uh, behind my new book and also connect it to the general theory of performance that some of you may know from Perform or Else. And now, as these books suggest, higher education is in crisis due to external political pressures and internal divisions in knowledge production. The crisis in the liberal arts uh, is particularly distressing as higher education in U.S. society has long prided themselves on producing well-rounded students who have developed critical thinking and writing skills across the arts and sciences. Now, these books analyze many of the reasons for the current crisis, and these include neoliberal economics, a backlash from the cultural uh, uh, upheavals associated with the 1960s, changes in demographics, and also disruptive technologies. Now, my new book agrees with most of these arguments, but it also situates the crisis within larger ontohistorical contexts, dating back to the Enlightenment, indeed all the way back to Plato. Now, we can understand these wider contexts uh, through this diagram, which is in uh, the Performer Else book, From Discipline to Performance. And it is the conceptual architecture or the installation site for the general theory of performance. And Performer Else uh, explicitly rehearses this theory, and this theory is still being rehearsed. Um, and let me give you a quick tour for those that are not familiar with it. Starting here um, at the level of performative uh, and performance blocks. And these are basically discourses and practices 
which come together. And so Schechner did a lot of theorizing on the performance side, and Butler did a lot of theorizing on the performative side. But these two come together to create subjects and objects. Okay. Um, at the second level, these are these different cultural, uh, technological, and organizational performance paradigms. These are different paradigms of research, and they are guided by different performance values. Performance studies really stresses the cultural efficacy of performances. Engineers look at the performances of things like bottles and technology, and these are about technological effectiveness, and the organizational folks are really interested in efficiency. These, I argue, developed alongside each other after the Second World War, but are increasingly coming into, uh, into, uh, into relationships. And believe it or not, there are people that write algorithms about how to optimize these different performances. Now, um, this third level is the, what I call the performance stratum. And this is thinking about performance as an onto-historical stratum of performance uh, of knowledge and power. And I'm building here on Leotard's work on the performativity of postmodern knowledge, as well as Herbert Marcuse's notion of the performance principle, which he theorized in 1955, going way, way back, as the reality principle of post-industrial societies. So um, the book focuses on these uh, three different levels. And um, in Foucault's terms, uh, you, know, you know what discipline is. And this performance, if you want to think about it, um, uh, Hart and Negre talk about empire, and this is another way to think about the performance stratum. Uh, Virilio talks about uh, the dromosphere, and so these are ways to think about what I'm talking about when it comes to uh, the performance stratum. Now, the new book, Transmedia Knowledge, focuses less on um, these performance paradigms and more on the transvaluation of performative values, and it calls for injecting values of cultural efficacy into systems dominated by uh, organizational uh, efficiency and technological uh, eff effectiveness. Um, another way to think about the difference, and really the main way to think about the difference between the new book and the old book, has to do with the performance stratum. Uh, as I said, in the first book I really look at performance in relationship to modern discipline and humanism. In the second book I'm looking at it in relationship the shift from literacy to digitality. So I'm associating performance with digitality. Okay. Uh, like writing and logos, digitality is a pharmacon, both good and bad, and ultimately undecidable. It's what I call perform, uh, perfumative. And so I'm really thinking about uh, the relationship of performance and digitality, which Negro Ponte described as the condition of being digital. Now, the first mission of the, uh, of the new book is to democratize digitality, just as in the 19th century, education sought to democratize literacy. And I define digitality as the onto-historical apparatus and which reinscribes oral, literate, numerate, and gestural archives into network databases, that is, into the internet, and the associated changes in identity formation, social organization, and ontological uh, world building. So the book, really, uh, to democratize digitality a higher education, I argue, must rethink the division of knowledge into different disciplines and different learning spaces. Basically, the seminar room is the space of the humanities and the social sciences. The studio is the space of art and design. And the lab is the space of science and engineering. So to integrate them, I invented a pedagogy called Studio Lab. And I first did this at NYU, where I took graduate students from the performance studio down into the computer lab in order to make electronic performances. And for the last 20 years, I've been refining this pedagogy, and the new book really is putting it all together. Okay? Um, today, Studio Lab mixes the learning activities found in these different spaces in order to open them out into a fourth space out of the field, that is, the community, the space of the world. Now, at Wisconsin, um, we built these media studios. This is one big space. And the big uh, innovation here is putting everything on wheels. So it can function in seminar space. It can open up and you can do rows like this and teach software. Or they can be put into workspaces like studio spaces and work around them all in one space. These are actually very, very inexpensive learning spaces. And I highly recommend uh, if Texas A&M doesn't have these, you might think about doing this to get this kind of integration happening. Um, the idea is to combine critical thinking, aesthetic creation, and media making all in one space. Now, the book is a manifesto for Studio Lab, and it provides 
also provides an understanding for the more experimental back end of performer else. All that challenger stuff, you've got to the back end, it's very experimental. This kind of explains the poetics of it. And today I describe it in terms of transmedia knowledge. What is transmedia knowledge? I describe it as knowledge created and shared with different stakeholders by moving across different media, such as books, presentations, videos, installations, posters, and websites. The key thing is knowledge moving across different media, thus transmedia. Now, some of the examples are good old-fashioned uh, academic essay, Pecha Kuchas, you guys know Pecha Kuchas, 20 by 20, uh, information comics, and community installations, all right? Um, other things, science rap, uh, science posters, dance your PhDs. There are about 20, 30, 40 of these genres. Higher education really focuses on this one. This is what graduate school does, teaches you to produce this. I'm arguing we need to think about these other transmedia genres as well. Now, we can also understand transmedia knowledge in terms of the relationship between expert and common knowledge. And this goes all the way back to uh, a series of opposition that informs the, uh, the Western Academy. And here I'm drawing upon work done by Derrida and McLuhan and Hav Havelock er uh, Ellis. Eric Havelock, excuse me. Uh, so expert knowledge, if you know your Plato and the Phaedrus, epistem is real true knowledge that takes place through ideas, or what he called eidos. And we should remember that Plato invented ideation at a particular time, and he did it through logos and logic. Now, he opposed this to the doxa or common knowledge that he associated with the Homeric tradition, which he said could only work in, in terms of image thinking and mythos or stories. And Plato's method, uh, dialectics, was he called a medicine that fought against mimesis, which was a drug. So it's basically a medicine and drug. If you know Derry Dawes reading, this is the pharmacon. Now, these oppositions also guide the West's encounter with its other and also shape the university's relationship to popular culture. Overcoming these oppositions is key to sharing our research with the public in a rich, meaningful way. Again, transmedia knowledge remixes these two types of knowledge, and it's like mixing scholars and rappers. If you're familiar with A.D. Carson's dissertation, rap dissertation, this was produced at Clemson University, um, let me just share a little bit of this and um, comment on it. They say history is written by the victors. So when you see my picture in a book, it'll be consistent with my memory. is really just uh, now that's like in a, in a real practical way just say it's a, it's a rap album it's a rap album that is the text of the dissertation so rather than it being like about rap or it being about like spoken word it's actually done through those uh, particular modes of presentation uh, people that wanted to get it the way that they live in the and one of the reasons that I really wanted to do it that way is because, you know, it's just like the metaphor that I use is like dope. Quali said, you know, I, I speak at schools a lot because they, they say I'm intelligent. No, it's because I'm dope. If I was whack, I'd be irrelevant. I'm striving to be dope. Or if what we do is dope, like by we, I mean rappers. What happens is it gets cut a whole lot of times, hip-hop and sociology or hip-hop and literature or hip-hop and whatever else it is that we cut it with, uh, this world of academia, you know, however we want to describe it, is, is that world not ready for that dope in its, like, uncut form? Can a scholar is not just create or speak through hip-hop as opposed to having it, like, mixed with something else in order for it to be acceptable? We already know that people can experience and talk about rap without having someone else filter. So this dissertation is a rap album. It's transmedia. There's also a video channel, a photo gallery, and lyrics that are transcribed on Rap Genius. There's a blog that also has video content on it. And there's a timeline that has multimedia links as well as bibliographical information. Owning My Masters was composed to engage many audiences, academic peers, general public, the brothers and sisters, and uh, folks in the community centers. Now, one purpose of my talk today is to get you thinking about how to engage your research and teaching, not only with specialized audiences, but also with 
uh, different publics, okay? different audiences, different stakeholders. And it's important to think about audiences as stakeholders. When we think about audiences, it's usually somebody we are talking at or to. Stakeholders are people that have stakes in what you're doing, okay? And they are potential collaborators. So the first mission of the Studio Lab pedagogy is to, again, democratize digitality. And it calls upon readers to become makers. And by become makers, I mean moving from consuming or only critiquing media to becoming an active maker of transmedia knowledge. The transmedia knowledge book is structured on three missions and three modes of becoming. And becoming maker simply means becoming maker of transmedia knowledge, retooling one's mind and body to think and act through media beyond the, acad the academy's traditional media, that is articles and books. And I will stress that writing and critical thinking remain crucial across almost all the transmedia knowledge forms I'm going to talk about today. So it's not a matter of opposing writing and critical thinking, it's about reinscribing them in a different space. So, at Cornell and elsewhere, I give to, uh, workshops to researchers from across the arts and the sciences, as well as the profession. And why transmediate your knowledge? And there are many reasons. First, it can introduce your work to new audiences. It can also produce different kinds of make, ways of making arguments. You probably all know induction and deduction. This is what Plato gave us and what Aristotle gave us, based upon this tree of knowledge but there are other types of logic and all other ways of having ideas and thoughts, including abduction, which is pierces, these are leaps from one domain to another, and something called conduction. When you put two knowledges together, you will get flashes, okay? So, more ways of making arguments. It also uh, introduces new evidence tracks. And one thing I was talking about with the graduate students today, are there other ways you can get media into your work? Okay, whether it's video, images, sound. Okay, one thing about performance studies, it should have been doing this for a long time, but we had to legitimate ourselves as disciplinary formations and produce good old fashioned books. But there's an opportunity to make other kinds of knowledge. Okay, uh, transmedia knowledge also allows for the co creation of knowledge, and this is happening out in the, the world with community based participatory research methods and it can produce different kinds of impacts. Okay, not just communicating discoveries, but changing perceptions, informing policies. I do a lot of work with folks that work in the, in the healthcare, and there you're really basically affecting people's lives and perhaps saving lives, okay? Um, and indeed, I would say that uh, public health has been doing transmedia knowledge for about a century, okay? I'm just providing a way to think about it in a little bit way. So this is some of the theory behind my current research into performance, digitality, and transmedia knowledge. I'm going to jump now to the uh, second part, which is design. I've said that Studio Lab's first mission is to democratize digitality, and it does, through, does so through a second mission, and that is democratizing design. If democratizing literacy means that everyone becomes a writer, democratizing digitality means that everyone becomes a designer. Workers tend to, uh, writers tend to work in one transmedia form, that is the alphabet. And it's important to recognize the alphabet is transmedia. It's word, it's sound and, and image in one thing. And in fact, translating that inside of our mind is ideation. Okay, so the alphabet is already transmedia. Designers work across different media. They are makers of transmedia knowledge. Now we can find designers across this campus. I'm sure there are some right in this department. There are also some in engineering, in game design, in fashion, and environmental studies. Now, Studio Lab embraces all of these design fields while seeking to democratize a more general practice of design, critical design. The industrial designers Don and Robbie argue that critical design is design infused with a critical sensibility and that it unfolds not only in scholarly texts but also in objects and processes out in the world. Unlike art, they argue, Design can situate critical thinking in a, directly in the world without representation and dramatization. I would say art it tends to be representational while design is operational. Or more bluntly, artists make art and designers make everything else. Design can be understood as the art or performance of everyday life, incarnated in food, clothing, environments, and experiences around the world. And it's significant that the subfield of performance design, how many of you heard of the field of performance design? It mostly comes out of PSI and performance philosophy. And these are folks that study, say, theater design, 
urban planning and uh, the design of spaces, particularly with bodies in them, okay? Now, Studio Lab is a critical design pedagogy that mixes critical thinking with tactical media and design thinking. Critical thinking refers to the use of argument and evidence, and it forms the basis of Western thought. Tactical media was developed by artist activists to fight for social justice. And design thinking is human-centered design applied to organizational and social problems. Studio Lab's critical design process uses digital media to bring analytic and creative research to collaborative problem solving. Studio Lab reinscribes critical thinking and writing into critical design and transmedia knowledge, just as Artaud tried to reinscribe the dramatic script within the theater of cruelty, and Derrida tried to reinscribe logocentricism within grammatology. So it's a similar move. It's not an opposition, it's a displacement or a reinscription or a transmediation. My critique of Derrida is he remained too much in the book. He did not transmediate enough. Transmedia knowledge is post-platonic, post-ideational. It offers a new image of thought. That new image of thought is what I call thought action figures. They are to digitality what ideas were to literacy, an emerging mode of thinking and acting. Thought action figures, or TAFs, are not limited to human beings. Animals, plants, machines, processes, materialities, ideal entities, all are becoming TAFI that is sticky networks and formed by chance and necessity that gather and disperse events throughout the multiverse. TAFs challenge the mind-body split, the theory-practice divide, and the performative performance disjunction. Now TAFs, like I said, are not limited to human figures. Indeed, some of the most powerful thought action figures are inanimate objects, plants, animals, and machines. For instance, Jacob's Ladder from the Old Testament visualized movement between different levels of existence. Centuries later, Aristotle's famous categorize divided and split up these levels into different branches, producing the tree structure described by Neoplatonists. From these platonic roots descend genus, gender, genre, as well as specialized knowledge that structures our universities, our colleges, our departments, and our subspecialties. You can see how powerful this tree is. Contemporary philosophers such as uh, Deleuze and uh, the psychoanalyst or schizoanalyst Guattari have challenged this arborescent or tree thought with rhizomatic thought modeled on rhizomes such as grasses and tubers whose root systems form transversal nodes and networks. So stepping back, the tafts of ladder, tree, and rhizome correspond respectively to orality, literacy, and digitality, and thus to ritual, theater, and performance. Today, thought action figures emerge as functional thinking machines which multiply almost by themselves. So the second mission of Studio Lab is to democratize design, to make the critical design of transmedia knowledge as ubiquitous as critical thinking and alphabetic writing. To move to this next level requires another level of becoming beyond making. It requires becoming builder. Just as transmedia knowledge offers a new image of thought, becoming builder offers a new image of the thinker. Thought action figures are to digitality what Rodin's The Thinker was to literacy, a model of thinking and acting. The figure of the romantic genius of originality was displaced, is being displaced by the collaborative bricolure of recombination. The thinker stands up, she makes media and joins a critical design team that builds shared experiences and collaborative platforms. So now what I'm going to do is share some of my own collaborative work in critical design. For the past two years, I have been collaborating with the Serbian performance scholar Anita Stojnic to design and produce a wide range of transmedia knowledge, from essays to comics to videos to live lecture performances. We call our collaboration McKinsey Stojnic, 
and our method is to perform thought action figures, incarnating ideas and concepts as we transmediate across different genres and life forms. This is our website, mckinseystoinic.org, where you can find examples and documentation of our work. And uh, this is a performance in uh, Utrecht where we got the Dutch to dance. The Dutch are famous for not dancing, and we got them to dance, so we consider that a success. Now we recently did a performance at the uh, World Congress of Aesthetics in Belgrade, and the piece is called Happy Perfumatives, and it engages Austin's performative and the figure of marriage in Western thought. Hegel, for instance, theorized the Aufhebung of spirit and matter through the figure of marriage. See, and if you know anything about Hegel, this is the phenomenology of spirit and basically the whole ball of wax theorized through marriage. Now, one of the most famous marriage scenes in philosophy is J.L. Austin's discussion of happy and unhappy performatives. Here's what Austin had to say 60 years ago in Sweden. For a performative opera to be entirely successful in the basket it has to be, in general, issued in the right circumstances. If one or more or quite a number of different kinds of conditions are not satisfied, then the performative action will be in trouble. And we shall say, for the sake of the word, it will be unhappy in various ways. To go back to our other example, if I say the words of the marriage ceremony, I do take this woman to be my lawful wife. And if I am, in fact, already married, wife living on divorce and so on, then I do not succeed in performing the act of marrying at all, but only I've only gone through the form of marrying. Similarly, I cannot baptize penguins because penguins are not a fit and proper object for this form of exploitation. This recording of Austin was discovered just recently, and it's great that we have his voice. We should know that the fact that it's a recording in the book, How to Do Things with Words, is based upon a recording. And remember, he excluded recordings from the realm of the performative. So if his work has had any kind of impact in the world, it is doing something um, that would interest this fellow, Jacques Derrida. In signature event context, Jacques Derrida deconstructs the opposition of happy and unhappy performatives, noting that Austin himself gestures beyond it towards a general theory of performatives. It is here that Derrida develops the notion of general citationality or iterability. Now, iter means both repeat and other. So iterability means other ability as well as citationality. Derrida marks this iterability with the pun sept of the perfumative which he develops in his reading of Joyce's Ulysses. The perfumative is the citational mist of any and all performances and performatives. Perfumatives point to the iterability of all performatives and performances. In the case of weddings and marriages, this citationality and other ability stretches back millennia like a collective unconscious, and we see it in painting, songs, and narratives. I'm interested in perfumative marriages as pharmacon. On the one hand, marriage is central to the legal and economic system of patriarchy and heteronormativity. On the other hand, marriage is a site for queering political sovereignty at individual and collective levels. Now we can see this struggle in two versions of Keith Haring's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. The first was created in 1984, the height of Reaganism and the AIDS crisis. The hands of heaven and hell reach up but do not touch. 
Now in another version from that same year, which hung as a curtain for a French ballet based on William Blake's illuminated book, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, the hands make contact. The heavenly hand places a ring on the hand of hell, and the union or marriage takes place. And in the upper right-hand corner, we can see two interlocked ring figures, same-sex couple flying up into the heavenly realm. Now, the hand with the ring is a powerful symbolic gesture, a pose that emerges out of the citational network of perfumatives. Now, of course, perfumance enables the emergence of new elements, that is, new poses, new gestures, new fashions. And perhaps most importantly, a change in casting, the expansion of proper persons being married to include gay marriages. Perfumates, the perfumative iterability exposes the plasticity of marriage. The citationality is recursive, and these performative forces can cascade through larger social systems. Now, this map from Wikipedia shows countries where same-sex marriage and civil unions are legal. Other countries where such unions are not recognized or are restricted, and those countries where same-sex intercourse is illegal and may be punishable by death. As you can see, the majority of countries don't recognize or allow gay marriage or gay sex. Now, LGBT, uh, LGBT marriage is literally affecting the sovereignty of individuals and nations worldwide. And we can see this in relationship to the EU. There are countries trying to get into the EU that do not recognize gay marriage, and believe Serbia is one of them. Again, Marriage is a union, and the union of individual subjects resonates with the union of nation states and international alliances. So this gives you some sense of how Aneta and I have been performing thought action figures in live lecture performances. TAFs extend far beyond ideas and concepts to include images and affects, stories and contests, songs and rhythms. They are themselves pharmacons with unstable identities and effects. As importantly, TAFs combine art and life, models and reality, minds and bodies. For their part, lecture performances are pop very popular in Europe and demonstrate some of the more experimental forms that transmedia knowledge and critical design can take. Now, this brings me to the third and final part of my presentation, activism. Thus far, I've talked about my current work from the perspectives of theory and design, arguing that the crisis of higher education requires scholars to reinscribe critical thinking and writing within the wider space of critical design and transmedia knowledge. We become makers of transmedia knowledge and builders of collaborative platforms by integrating learning activities currently siloed away from each other. We need to mix conceptual, aesthetic, and technical skills in collaborative, transdisciplinary pro uh, projects because the problems of the world are holistic, not specialized. Now, the mission of democratizing digitality and design requires us to seek out new models for thinkers and actors, theorists, and practitioners. In Studio Lab, students become builders by role playing in critical design teams modeled on critical art ensemble. The, griddle, the Guerrilla Girls, and other artist activist groups, emulating their mix of cultural, technological, and organizational performances. One part of critical design involves conducting critical thinking in tactical media, that is, transmedia knowledge that challenges and sometimes subverts dominant power relationships. And critical uh, art ensemble have done, have done a lot of theorizing and practicing of this tactical media. As we've seen, the model is not the, uh, the romantic original genius, but the collaborative uh, recombinant, uh, recombinant or recombinant bricolore. Now, as I said at the start, the new book addresses the crisis of the liberal arts, and its title again is Transmedia Knowledge for Liberal Arts and Community Engagement. Now, Studio Lab Manifesto calls for mixing activities siloed in seminar, studio, and lab spaces in order to enter a fourth space, that of the field, the community space outside the academy. And so I'm going to conclude by discussing a project that I am just beginning, and it's called Civic Storytelling in Rural Communities. Now, the motivation for this project are the devastated communities across America. 
As you may know, life expectancy in the United States has declined for three straight years, driven by overdoses and suicides of people in their 20s and 30s. Deaths both caused and contributing to the decline in rage of communities who feel left behind, who increasingly resent and reject the knowledge coming out of public and private universities and colleges. Kathy Kramer at Wisconsin has described the politics of resentment that drove Governor Scott Walker's attack on state universities. She basically went around and interviewed people around the state of Wisconsin and found that they really did not like Madison. Okay? And you could say what uh, Trump has done is nationalized this resentment. Jonathan Metzl argues that this resentment combines racism and rejection of government programs such as Obamacare. Some whites would rather die than accept expert knowledge and public support. This is where transmedia knowledge and civic storytelling can potentially intervene. In this new project, I'm collaborating with Gretchen Romarczyk, who is a uh, cooperative extension colleague in development sociology. Formerly, that was agricultural sociology. Our goal is to get high school students to use transmedia knowledge and critical design to begin civic storytelling within their communities. Civic storytelling is the sharing of stories, both intimate and strategic, between different stakeholders to address pressing issues within local communities. Now, my interest in civic storytelling grows out of my research and teaching of transmedia knowledge. For the past uh, year or two, my Cornell students have worked with refugee teens at a local uh, community center through the Urban 4-H Club, and also with teens awaiting trial in the New York juvenile justice system at a high school called George Junior Republic. This year, I'm working with colleagues at another school, Dryden High School, outside of Ithaca, also with the local history center and the public library. The Civic Still, uh, Storytelling Project grows out of this work and my research on transmedia knowledge. And we're trying to develop a civic story kit, which will enable real stories about real issues for real audiences and help connect rural schools and other community groups at, to faculty at Cornell and other schools in central New York. The kit will be online and it will offer different ways for uh, uh, teachers, potentially any uh, school or discipline, to work in these transmedia genres, such as comics, pechacuchas, videos, and installations. Developed from the bottom up with rural teachers and students, the kit will feature ideas, assignments, examples, and other materials, again, that potentially any teacher can use. And some of the things we are working on are precisely suicide, addiction, poverty, things that are really affecting these, these communities. In upstate New York, the populations are declining rapidly. Also, they think in the next two years, something like 60% of school teachers and 60% of school superintendents will leave the profession. There is a crisis in public education. So in Ithaca, we're planning to have a series of civic storytelling events at our beautiful new uh, history center in downtown Ithaca. The center directors wants not only our students to come and tell stories there, but also to use their archives to put their stories into, uh, they have a, something called a story vault. This is built in an old bank, and they actually have the old vault there. You can walk in and record things. Um, but they also are interested in students uh, doing UX analyses of their installations, and more importantly, developing new forms. So if you know digital storytelling, it's often just a headshot like this. Imagine kids using Instagram to start doing totally different genres of storytelling. This is what they are interested in. Now, this spring we're going to be developing a, a kit, a pilot kit, with folks at Dryden High School and our local BOCES. BOCES stands for the Board of Cooperative Education Services, which provides local school districts with services for kids with special needs and enhancements such as art. We're also reaching out, so this is where Cornell is, we're also reaching out to Syracuse and Hobart William Smith. The, the idea is to match make between colleges and local rural schools in order to help faculty learn to transmediate their work for local communities and provide feedback uh, coming the other way. 
Our hope is that the Civic Story Kit can be a catalyst for matching rural schools and other members of something called the Central New York Humanities Corridor. Our hum uh, Humanities Center has a $1 million grant from Mellon called Rural Humanities, and it's providing this, it, we connect to these other schools, all right? Now this brings us to Studio Lab's third mission, and that is to remix or to transvaluate performative values. Specifically, um, to bring, as I said before, to inject values of cultural efficacy, that is of doing the right thing, into organizations and social systems dominated by values of technical effectiveness and organizational efficiency. So the argument is from performer else, contemporary organizations do not legitimate their knowledge and power through grand narratives anymore, but through input-output matrices. Okay, so we could ask how this department is doing in terms of its hitting its performance marks, um, or whether you're still legitimating yourself through grand narratives. That would be interesting. Uh, so cultural efficacy is the bread and butter of performance studies, but I'm interested in problem solving far from discipline and revalorizing efficiency and effectiveness rather than only critiquing them. Okay, there is something about efficiency and effectiveness we should pay attention to because it allows our projects to be scalable and sustainable. Now this is where the third component of critical design comes into play. In addition to critical thinking and tactical media, Studio Lab turns to the collaborative problem solving method of design thinking. Design thinking is a human-centered design practice developed at Stanford's D School and the design firm IDEO. Beyond its use by businesses, schools and universities have also been exploring its educational for potential for about a decade. Why is it of interest to Studio Lab? Design thinking focuses around three generative constraints, human desirability, technical feasibility, and financial viability. These map directly into the performance values of efficacy, effectiveness, and efficiency. In short, uh, design thinking provides an off-the-shelf method for doing the things I've been trying to do for many years, and I've just probably discovered in the last seven or eight years. If you're familiar with design thinking's design process, it starts by basically doing field work, empathizing with folks out in the field, reframing or redefining problems once you talk to people out in the field, and then within this space, ideating or brainstorming and coming up with new solutions, prototyping them, and then finalizing them, okay? This is a nonlinear process. You should see this feedback. Now, in terms of performance values, it works like this. You start with efficacy. Are you doing the right thing from the beginning? You prototype, is this effective? And again, you go out and test it. And then once you decide, then you're basically making it efficient. Okay? The idea is not for McKinsey to go out and tell these students to do this. It's to train them in design thinking and to get them identifying their stakeholders and doing this, okay? So it's trying to be as bottom-up, that's what's called human-centered design. Now, there's incredible research that happens, uh, advanced research in design thinking, and this is known as a two-by-two -two conceptual model. How many of you have ever seen this before? Comes out of engineering. So this was developed to look at collaboration of software development, and the two axes are abstraction, high abstraction, low abstraction, low resolution, and high resolution. Projects start with sketches, they move through rough, rough prototypes, user prototypes, test products, and then manufactured products, okay? You get the same values happening across here. Big innovation happens there. You're not very far in. Small innovation happens down here. Conduction and abduction, big ideas, happen up there. Induction and deduction happen down here. Now this may seem very alien to us, but if we switch over to something like theater production, we will find similar flows. So transmedia knowledge cascades through media. Ideation is just one moment, so again, what Plato thought was king of the world is just a moment. This is what transmedia knowledge is all about. And again, you're going to see this 
flowing through this way. So this is why efficiency and effectiveness are important, not just efficacy, okay? Now, this is coming out, these models are coming out of engineering. Let me switch to one from the social sciences. How many are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? All right. Yes, oops. That already went too fast. Basic needs here, psychological needs here, and really the high ones. So epistem, doxa, and bare life. Okay. Transmedia knowledge happens as a mix-up of these two. Civic storytelling is working at this level down here. Okay, and if we can zoom in here, we can see how this works. Those are discursive and embodied. This is what uh, uh, Guattari and Lazzarato call the diagrammatic. We put this into performance studies terms. That's performatives and performances. And these are the perfumatives down here. Okay, these tend to be micro and macro performances which escape human consciousness. Okay. So, to finally conclude, oh, what the? It's not there. Yes, okay. The Studio Lab pedagogy begins by folks becoming makers of transmedia knowledge, becoming builders of collaborative platforms, and that means role playing in groups, and again, Theater has been doing this for forever. And if the romantic philosophers like Kant and Hegel had not prioritized painting and poets and instead prioritized theater, it would already be collaborative, it would already be transmedia. Okay? The final part is becoming cosmographers or designers of possible worlds. And this is what I'm trying to get those kids to do, imagine different worlds. Thank you. Yes. Um, can you talk more about the process of helping young people to come up with projects? Yes. So um, I'm working with uh, at Dryden with a media arts teacher. She's already got her students making videos and working in groups. So they're already makers and builders in my sense. What they have not been doing is thinking about taking what they're doing. Well, two things. They really haven't been addressing really tough issues. Lots of times they are self-expression or come up with kind of a funny play. That's great. Can we get them actually dealing with real problems? The second thing is, is to do that storytelling outside of the classroom. So what we did, we went in with a model of this kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it? I'm working with, with guys working with an NSF grant called Transform. And it's like this thing that you can make media and present media on. But what we did was say, okay, take this thing and now imagine it for two different audiences in two different places. Like down in the, the public park in Dryden. Or take it into Ithaca and imagine presenting it, say, to the local school board getting those students thinking about doing their, what they're doing to people besides themselves and their teachers. The stakes go way, way up. They are nervous. Even presenting to me. A couple of professors come in and they're presenting to me and they're shaking, but afterwards they're like, oh wow, that was empowering. So part of it is just getting them to do that and to, um, again, we're planning to go to the History Center. We don't yet know what the audiences are. It could just be their parents. It could just be the PTA or it could be someone else, but just getting them out of that space into another space, talking to real people about real issues is very, very empowering. The big move is to try to pilot it at this level with some real uh, uh, um, test proof of concept, and then jump to this other level, and this is where BOSES comes in, because then you're working with superintendents. So if you can get superintendents at this level and real projects here, then you've got a pincher movement that can put pressure on principals and teachers. Okay, so that is the big move. Yeah, so that's what we're trying to do. I will say that uh, where I'm inspired, there have been a number of suicides in the local school system. And uh, Sonny Miller, the person at BOCES, uh, worked with a student that made a video about one of these suicides. Okay, what I am really hoping to do is to jumpstart uh, youth-driven uh, group 
analogous to say the Parkland kids or the Sunrise Movement, you know, the environmental, around mental health. It is a taboo subject in schools. So one thing that connects Cornell to these schools is suicide. Because there are suicides at Cornell, people jump off those lovely bridges into gorges. That's something that Cornell does not want to talk about. That's something that the schools don't want to talk about. But they know that mental health and well-being is really, really crucial. Okay, so one thing that's happening in New York, they're taking the model of community uh, schools that's come out of cities, comes out of New York City, that schools are also places for mental health, place for safety. They're not just schools. So they're exporting that out into the rural communities. Another thing I'm trying to do is bring something from design thinking. It's called designing for extreme affordability. So at the D school, they teach this, and the model is we're going to help uh, women in Africa uh, have better water supplies, people that make $2 a day. Well, you don't have to go to Africa to find poverty. It's just 20 miles outside of Ithaca, you've got extreme poverty. So use that same model and try to problem solve there. Yes. So um, I think my question is, is related to the question you just asked. Okay. And that I'm curious, I'm thinking about the relationship between your work with uh, Mackenzie Sonich and the, the Civic Storytelling Project. In one area, your work with Mackenzie Sonich is theoretically dense. You know, it seems from what we've seen that these trappings of sort of high art to not be quite as accessible. The, the, or I shouldn't prejudge like that, but you know, it's, no, it's in a different mode. Uh, the work with the Civic Storytelling Project is, as you said, bottom up, is devoted to accessibility and to kind of bringing a variety of stakeholders in. So I'm curious about how you, as a, a thinker and creative artist, sort of navigate moving between those two layers. Sure. And I'm also thinking about what the art world, uh, uh, the way in which you can join the theory and art on the one hand with uh, institutions and policy on the other, because the, the Civic Storytelling Project is as much about the institutional performance that you've been talking about. Right. So that's a great question. So one thing I'm doing, so we did that at an International Congress of Aesthetics, who are very straight-laced, very disciplined, just to show that there are other ways of working. They are, for, however, have studied the avant-garde a lot. They are familiar with it. So you bring those avant-garde practices in, just as I'm doing here today, to go, look, you know this stuff. Can you do it? You, I get the sense that you folks are doing this. You are a group that's ripe for this. Um, by connecting that to these, if you like, lower level ones, it's just to show the expanse. Mm -hmm. okay? When I first got into theory in the 1980s, there was a lot of experimentation. Derrida, Bart, uh, Trinman, Ha. That moment passed for whatever reason. There was a lot of experimentation. So I'm just trying to connect that high end. So one is transforming one kind of institution higher ed, and another one is helping to transform another, okay? And as you know, there's been a lot of community-based art, experimental community-based art that already has come together. But you're right, they are sort of at two, and I was first gonna do one just about the real experimental. And then I said, no, I wanna talk about this other one as well, but I'm not as far along, and I don't have as much things to show. I could show some of my students' projects, but they are not yet this project that these high schoolers, and so, in a year from now, I'm hoping to have those to show, but that is a great question. But the idea is, so the big thing is, is post-ideational thinking. It's getting us to think beyond ideas, okay? And so that, ex and that is what that, those French experimenters, that's what, you know, the arcade project that Benjamin was doing, a similar thing. Thinking beyond the tree, thinking along beyond forms is things, so the thought action figures violate like the three laws of thinking. Identity, non-contradiction, and the excluded third middle. So it's trying to think that mode and think, this is the thinking in terms of pharmacon. It's not just writing is pharmacon, the world is pharmacon. It is in the end undecidable, but it is shapeable. Okay, I don't know if that answers your question. It does very well, but it leads me to a follow-up question, yeah. like a point of clarification with the, the thought action figures, mm -hmm. and thinking, you know, it seems to be very important that they are, of course, images that you're showing us and not the words, even though the words are there as well. Mm -hmm. But it also seemed that each one was functioning in part as metaphor, and of course, in the discipline we talk of is and as performance, where we're interested in a space where metaphors fall apart and cease to be metaphors. I don't know if I have a fully formed question. No, but just thinking about how metaphor fits into yeah, yeah. the text. So, um, 
it, these, these can be understood as metaphor, and a lot of people will see them as metaphor, but metaphor is white mythology. Blanc, and this is Derrida has an article called Mythology Blanc. The West has concepts. Everybody else has figures. What Nietzsche taught us was our concepts are forgotten metaphors, but the thing is that there's no literal meaning. So uh, love is like a rose. Well, we have this unknown thing called love. Now we're going to go to a rose. But who has the proper notion of a rose? Is it the botanist? The gardener? What if it's the lover? Okay, so it moves beyond similarity and you get into all kinds. So this is basically where dream logic becomes important, which cannot fit into metaphor. It's condensation to displacement and ways of connecting things that are far exceed metaphor. Okay, so that's why they're not, they, they're easily, we easily understand them as metaphor because that's our way of dealing with it, that which is outside of concepts. And it's the same thing of logos and mythos, eidos and amagos method and ritual, concept and metaphor. So it is something to be displaced. You can use the metaphor, but you want to push far beyond. Great question, though. Yes. I wanted to uh, uh, describe another scenario. OK. And sort of get your comments about applicability. OK. Um, in Ghana, yes. um, there have been recently a discussion about what people have been referred to as a social crisis. Mm -hmm. um, this happened when higher education uh, was, was uh, limited in the sense that formerly government paid a lot of it, yeah. but you know, the neoliberal thrive and, you know. Just like America. Just like America. <laughs> and so, but as that had happened, there had also been an expansion of primary and secondary education. Hmm. So what happened that you, was that you had... Is that because of a population explosion? Why did primary and secondary explode? Um, partly so, okay. and large youth uh, population. Yeah. But also, even when the government moved away from higher education, yeah. it sort of put more of it into basic and, uh, and second period. Okay, interesting. Not as much as it should, uh, but much. it expanded there. Right. What has happened is that there are large numbers of, of young people right. who come out of the secondary education, but tertiary education has shrinked, and so there's a limit. There's nowhere for them to go. There's nowhere for them right. to go. Right. Uh, a lot of them, however, people say that we've moved beyond literacy to, to, to uh, digitization because a lot of them, because of the popularity of the right. are, are very, they are very adept at computers, and uh, you find them in the computer, uh, uh, what do you call those places? Cafe. No, in yeah, the cafes. Cafes. Yes. cafes. And this is, this is sometimes the, the, the origins of all our lives come, man, right? Because there's a channeling yeah. of the first economic frustration and lack of upward mobility into schemes that will generate some kind of income. And people have seen that as a social crisis. And I've been thinking about that as an opportunity. Uh -huh. in, the uh -huh. in the sense that this is a generation that is already into, into uh, 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 They have the technical skills. They have the technical skills, right. or at least show an affinity right. to develop it. And is that, you know, and I, 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 I've often wondered whether the way a higher education is structured is where I structured in a way that even suits the emerging skills of this generation, right? And what could be generated that would make use of that emerging skill, but at the same time provide the the address the problem of employment right. and need. Right. But right. some people say, well, why do you have all those skills? They will, they will, they will get into boss camps, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the sort of elite critique right, of denying this this community. But anyway, that's, I mean, you may not have the answers, but I'm just curious. Yeah. How are your thoughts? Well, I think that um, uh, we're more, for the, if you like, the base is much more fuller developed than the superstructure. We have these technical skills, but we don't have ways yet of thinking and organizing and thinking about uh, different ontologies. So, I mean, yeah, so they can do all these things, but really, are they organizing and are they, and 
I, I'm relying a lot on problem solving, but it could be that problem solving is part of the problem, or at least being led by specialists and experts is part of the problem. And so, um, I don't know if you know, there's, a, there's another uh, genre out there called RSA animates. Do you know these? So Royal S Society of Arts, and they will bring in someone like Zizek to give a talk, and then afterwards they will do one of these whiteboard animations. So it seems just as he's talking, there is one done by Zizek. There's also one done by a guy named Sir Ken Robinson called Changing Educational Paradigms. And what he looks at is uh, tests done on uh, divergent and convergent thinking. And divergent thinking is kind of coming up with a million answers. It's creativity, whereas convergent is coming to one answer. So if you're good at divergent thinking, like, I mean, the example he uses, imagine different uses of a paperclip. And we might come up with seven or eight, but if you're really good at that, you'd come up with four or 500. Because you're, you can do this. So they test, and I'm just channeling him, they test a group of uh, people, and they found like 98% of them were geniuses at divergent thinking. These kids were about four or five years old. After two or three years of schooling, guess what happens? Funk. Down. We specialized. So a lot of my students say, John, I haven't done anything like this since I was in elementary school. Okay? Because we're specialized. We're all seated. One of the big things that Aneth and I do, we look at the thinker. Why is thinking like this? Why are you guys all seated with your hands on your chin? It's, it's contemplative thought. It's inward thinking. So there are other modes of thinking. Um, so one is the, the infrastructure. The base is a far more advanced than the superstructure. And we don't yet, and yes, you come here and you specialize. That's what getting a degree is. So how can we do this and this other thing? because I have a book in my head called The Tree of Knowledge and the Rhizome of Life. The Tree of Knowledge is what the university produces, but life is rhizomatic. Siloed studies makes for siloed service. So we gotta figure out a way to problem solve from the bottom up in a much more transdisciplinary and I would say transmediated way. I don't know if that gets an answer kind of there, but the problem that is there is here too, okay? And that's, so why are 60 or 60% 60 of school teachers and superintendents getting out? The pay is terrible. They've had 10 years of first uh, no child left behind and then common core basically teaching to tests. There's one answer and you better know it. That, is, that kills both learning and teaching. Okay, so that's, there are lots of problems we're actually at Cornell trying to figure out, is this an opportunity for our humanities graduate students that we're having a hard time placing? You know, you would have to change the way that teachers are hired, because that itself is specialized in ed school. Is the ed school here or in Austin? Hmm? Is the education? There's, an ed school here. There's not an ed school here, is it in Austin? There's a college, yeah. There's, I'm sure there is, and I'm sure it gets certificates for people to teach out there. Okay, the question is not whether those are, do you know the answer? They do get certificates. Yeah. 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 Certificates in other departments in the liberal arts. Yeah. So one thing in Madison, they were getting rid of requirements for teachers. And we thought that was horrible. But now I'm thinking, oh, maybe that's a good idea because our, our humanities graduate students can get jobs teaching high school, though that's not really what they went to school to do. Good question. So then does the input and output matrix and matrices reify that? And this is a great question. So. There's part of me that says, yes, transvaluation of performative values, but that efficacy has probably still defined in all too human terms. So you have to think about going back to the displacement from discipline to performance, a, a move from a humanist to a post-humanist model, and then what are those values? Are those valid human values, or are there even values at that point? So the book that I've just written does not go to that performative level. It, it pulls its punches in terms of that question. So my thing is, use the system that's there, because everybody knows it, this input-output matrices, but try to get the efficacy, which tends to be qualitative, not quantitative. It's easy to quantify effectiveness and efficiency 
it's really hard to quantify this qualitative piece. So how do we get that qualitative piece into the mix? I don't know if I answered that well enough, but yes, it's there. We need to use and abuse it. And yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think that uh, when I think about it, that I hear uh, Dwight Conker with his ideas of co-performing in various communities. Yes. And trying to get to the center of that while simultaneously remaining reflexive. Right. Position. Right. My question would be, what's Dwight post-humanist? And what does it mean to put, when we have rights for trees and environments, what, how do you get that in? And then you go to basically different cosmologies, okay? Non-Western cosmologies where there are, I mean, the new kind of materialities is going that way. I mean, there's kind of a bump up between that. But yeah, you, so you're looking at, so there's three exclusions that I'm interested in. One is the Homeric tradition getting dance, song, music out, and only logos counts. That's one exclusion. The second one was with colonialism, where basically Descartes reboots ideation, and then colonialism spreads it around the world. The map of the world is eidos, mapped onto the world, little outlines, okay? And the third one is, in the university, popular culture. So we need to break down those exclusions, and probably maybe the most important one is that colonial one, because there are all these life worlds out there that could have potential. I mean, again, I can only fall into solutions, but maybe it isn't solutions. You know, maybe it's some other thing. I don't know if that answers that well enough. So yes, Dwight, absolutely. Just the question is, how do you get the non-human or the post-human into the mix? Follow-up? Go, no, go ahead. No, no, that's it. Were you there? No. Go no. ahead. <laughs> All right, okay. Just fine. Skepticisms, raw critiques. You're out of your mind, Mackenzie. <laughs> no? Yes. I'm not sure I understand the skill of the thought action figure. I'm not sure. Yeah. So if uh, I'm trying to think about it as a way to come up with, we're not only ideating, having these mental constructs, we are working across media and all of these things are figuration. So the, really the move is from ideation to figuration. And so Leotard was doing this, Bart was doing this, thinking about figuration that has much more of a, uh, well, that includes the affect. It's trying to get over the mind-body split because ideation is purely mental and figuration has been this thing that's sort of on the side of metaphor or side of myth, trying to come up with a mashup. So that's what thought action figures are. We do a lot with the human body because that's the way we figure. But some of the most powerful ones, and I showed another one, you know, the desktop. The desktop is there for a reason. You guys are sitting at desks. Bureaucracy is ruled by desk. It dates back to the Chinese. The original scholars were scribes. It's a powerful, powerful thought action figure that we don't even recognize, and it's very concrete, and it's also inscribed in our head. So part of it is just a materiality. What Nietzsche would say is you take the concept, you go to the metaphor, and then you play around with that material and where it leads. And it won't just be metaphorical at that point. So that it is, it takes practice, but once you kind of get it, it's like riding a bicycle, ah, figuration. And again, there have been a lot of people that have tried to theorize that. The trouble is, and this is kind of what I was dealing with performer else, concepts can only go so far, then you have to re-inscribe them in a different space. And that's what happens at the end of performer else. That crazy part, if you've ever gotten there with the challengers, that's happening, if you like, within an aesthetic frame. So that's an explosion. Yeah, it's an explosion, but it's also a gathering. I mean, so this is Heidegger's explosion and coming together at the same time. And you can think about thought. You can have mind-blowing ideas, but you can also concentrate. So the move is to have great flow, but then also these breaks. You need to have those breaks. Critical thinking is that break. It's critical distance. But we've just valorized that to that all we have, and we're suspicious of the embrace. So we need to be able to have both the embrace and that splitting up. Yeah. And become comfortable. And we do that anyway, but we usually cover over that. 
with some sort of nice linear narrative. No. Great question. I don't know that I can fully explain it. Because yeah, explanation just... is usually explain the unknown in terms of the known. And I'm trying to ship it out towards the unknown in a comfortable way. Yeah. I often say it's a move from um, isolated critiques of the bad to collaborative creations of joy. That could be under, understood that way. So it's not just isolated critiques. It's collaborative. And you guys have been in flow. You have. And you guys have also been in collaborative situations, which is hell on wheels. Right? Yeah. So. Good to the back. Do one more. Get follow up. Ready to follow up. And that is, uh, no. Where does kinesthetics come into it? That's what I thought you were going to ask. Well, I mean, I think that's the convergence and divergence and uh -huh. conjunction of that. I mean, even at the seat, even the scribe is in motion mm -hmm. to an extent. Very slow, right? I mean, I think the ultimate kind of negation of movement is, is the prison cell itself, ah. mm -hmm. which, as we know, rural communities are oftentimes invested in yep. the explosion of the prison industrial complex because mm -hmm. it creates a whole other kind of economy. Yep. Um, but I wanted to ask a, a kind of practical, a more practical question about how this then relates potentially to um, empathic design and UX design. And okay. are there, I, mean, I don't know if you get out of the conundrum that I think Professor Gondor was gesturing towards about, you have, you have this potential amongst individuals who are engaged in these Global scams or, or whatever, but the, the technology is there mm -hmm. behind it, which can be transformed to something else. But we have a complete erosion of the public, mm -hmm. right? Um, then how how then is this translatable potentially into empathic design and US UX experience or US? Yeah. So I did, you mentioned Instagram. Yeah. But that's all. That's really just a tool. That's a function. Yeah. How do we? So with each of those becomings, becoming, there's three design frames that this new book lays out. One of them is called CAT, that's conceptual, aesthetic, and technical. And that is, that maps right into seminar, studio, and lab. So one way to evaluate, so one of the problems, we know how to evaluate papers, because we've been doing it for millennia. We don't know how to evaluate these other transmedia forms. Of course, we're not practiced in them, and we don't have models. So I try to provide models. One is that cat. So you can look at what is happening conceptually in this, what's happening aesthetically, what's happening technically. Artists have a hard time because they're trained to merge those things. So they're like, I can't take them apart. But once you start transmediating across different media, you will see the concept tends to, and I have a great example, I didn't show it. The conceptual content tends to remain the same, whether you're doing a paper, a video, or a poster. The tool changes. It's Word, it's PowerPoint, it's whatever, Illustrator. Then the aesthetic can either change or not change, depending upon, for me, the target stakeholder. For me, the genres need to come out of the stakeholders. Okay, and then you can use that cat frame. So that's becoming maker. Becoming builder or collaborative, that's where I bring the UX in. And they're, you know, break this down to maybe too much. There is good old fashioned uh, experience design. What is the experience of hearing somebody come in and talk and you're sitting here and listening so you want understanding, maybe a literal I entertainment. The next part is information architecture. How was this thing structured? Three parts. Similar thing, boom, boom, boom. The third part is information design. What's the look and feel of each of those different parts? The model here though is ACT UP. Because ACT UP took that anger and rage inside of them, and they write about this, and transformed it into love and understanding. So there is an internal, what I call an experiential architecture that's connected to these platforms and these shared experiences. And that's what you're trying to do, is you're trying to shape yourself and then connect to another community and its platform, whatever it is. Okay, so that is the... That's where the UX part comes in. The third design frame is design thinking. So each one of those becomings maps into a particular 
design frame, and it, I kind of teach it that way. And again, uh, the CAT model is really formless. It's just, I'm describing this thing in front of me. The UX is, turns it around. What's the impact on a stakeholder? Desired impact, and it's some kind of a collective experience. Okay, so there would be, yes, you're not robo-scamming. You're doing, I mean, that's a platform connected to another platform, but what is the larger thing that comes out of that? Okay, so those kids could use that same platform and do something else if they were so oriented and this is where the ontological part comes in, a different ontology. Yeah, I don't know if that answers it, but the UX is there. So the question with empathy, empathy is a real double-sidedness. You're trying to feel, but you know, there are folks like Derrida and Levinas, can you really feel the other? Or is that colonialism itself? You know? And so when you think you've understood, maybe not. And so that's where the pharmacon comes in that undecidability and keeping that part in play in as healthy a way as you can because pharmacon means both poison and medicine. The next PSI, I think the call for papers just came out today, is called Crises of Care. And it's going to be looking at, this is in uh, Performance Studies International in Rayeka, what are the crises of care and what I'm interested in is scare structures, S slash care. Because what is caring for one person is scary as hell for another person. And how do you respect that undecidability? Yeah, yeah. Are universal human rights the greatest things in the world? Or hell on wheels? What if it was both? Yeah. All right. So then what do you do? Now, yeah. great question, whatever that question was. <laughs> yeah. So UX can go so far but they're always, it's gonna be limited. And the same with design thinking. These are all pharmacon. There's no true method that's gonna be pure and solve the problems of the world. Well, well, at least in my ontology, maybe in your ontology there are. But, yeah. My ontology is called Jontology. It means I can be full of shit and that I can flush the toilet and clear it out. Thank you guys.